Um, yeah, sorry about okay, that. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Well, brilliant. Thank you very much uh, for that, Pauline. And thank you very much uh, for everyone uh, for joining. Um, should be a little bit nervous. So a few more people joining uh, than, than I expected, but hopefully I can give you guys um, some useful advice. So in terms of timing, I will do my best to try and keep this within an hour. However, depending on what questions you all ask and probably a little bit dependent on how carried away I get with my explanations, uh, we may run over just a little bit so I'm afraid I can't give you precision on the timing but I will try and keep it to um, within an hour so really kind of um, the purpose of this talk today as you guys have probably seen is really kind of finding and selecting a good opportunity um, a, a, the right opportunity in a tough market so um, let's not pretend that the market isn't tough at the minute. It is fairly difficult. And it's, it's important for, especially if you're kind of embarking on your career, that you're able to perhaps have a little bit of an idea of kind of what good looks like. So you can put yourself into a good position. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So some of you may have joined my previous talk, some of you may not. So just a very brief introduction. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, I'm Matt. I am the Head of Learning and Development for Asia uh, with EAMS Consulting. So we are a recruitment group and I'm based in Singapore and we have an office in uh, Hong Kong as well. Uh, so I look after, so I kind of look after the L&D side of things really throughout here. So I've had a little bit of experience in terms of working with people trying to get into trying to get into different markets working within different working communities and um i'm now old enough that i've experienced a a recession or two myself so hopefully i'm in a good position to yeah hopefully i'm in a good position to talk about this so um what i will do guys is i'll break this up into a i will break this up into a few sections so what we'll do is we'll go through this section by section and then what I'll do is once we get to the end of each section, I'll give you guys a chance to perhaps ask any questions. And then we can ask some block questions at the end. So that should hopefully just break things up, um, hopefully just break things up a little bit. So kind of, as I said, objective of this session is really keeping your standards high when finding a new opportunity, uh, regardless of what the external economic conditions are. So. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is, and this, this is, I think, really important. A lot of people, when they are graduating university, I must admit, myself included in this when I graduated, um, kind of I didn't have an objective with what I was looking for. I kind of came out of university and thought, I don't know, I'll just, I'll just take anything. So a lot of people can come out of university in that situation. If you do have an objective of what you're looking for once you finish university, um, fantastic, good on you. You're already a good number of steps ahead of me uh, when I graduated. So having an objective and knowing what you want out of your role or career is, it, it is often quite important. Now for this, what, what I would say is really important with this is you don't have to be 100% sure of what you want to do. So for example, I, I love learning and development. That is why I've chosen to stay in this as a career. However, when I graduated, I didn't go, you know what I really want to do? I really want to do learning and development. It was something that just happened to fit my priorities and I found out about and, and I enjoyed doing. So you don't have to be 100% sure on what you want to do, but it is a good idea to perhaps have some idea of what you want your career to give you and have a think about what you would be satisfied with and what you would be happy with. And, and I think actually that word satisfaction is a really important thing to have a look at. So um, I've heard people before say, I'm looking for something that makes me happy. Now, that is an admirable thing to look for, but I would argue maybe you might be better for what actually gives me satisfaction because happiness can vary a lot from moment to moment, day to day. So maybe have a look at what type of thing gives me satisfaction. And that can be in your day to day, that can be in your kind of day to day role, that can be longer term. But have a think about what is it that I do that kind of makes me feel like I am doing something worthwhile because that will probably lead to happiness. So have a, so do ask yourself, what is it that I do that gives me satisfaction? That's where you can look back on your life experience that you've had so far and think in terms of in terms of what you've been studying, in terms of what um, 
yeah, in, in terms of what you've been studying, in terms of what you have been, um, in terms of what work you've done before, in terms of your previous experiences, um, have a look back and think, what have I done that has given me a bit of satisfaction? So, for example, when I first when I first went to university, I I never really thought I would enjoy working with people. Never really aspired for that to be something that was part of my career. And then I realised actually those things I did at university that involved working as part of a team, working with other people, but something actually I did get real satisfaction of. So that kind of changed my objectives a little bit later on and thinking, okay, I should probably try and look for something where I do work with people because that's something that I actually, I, I do get that, uh, I, I do get that kind of a, a good feeling of purpose about. So have a look at that. And something else I would say to have a look at is what's important to you generally as well so not just what's important to you from a work perspective but what's important to you generally when when, when someone's work objectives and what they look for in the workplace can, be, can become too detached from what they want in their personal life that can sometimes lead to a few issues as well and often leads to the um to dissatisfaction um down down the road uh, you, you guys can keep a tally of how many times i say satisfaction in one in one session it's probably going to be a lot so but i, I would have a think about that if it, it actually just what is important to you generally and that can help in a tough climate because the exact job you were originally looking for may not necessarily be available at this moment in time but if you can find something similar that still hits that hits those things that are important then you can still go out there and, and feel like you've actually, you're actually doing something worthwhile. So that's why it's good to identify things that are generally important to you, because it will allow you to look at things you may not have necessarily considered originally, but will still give you that confidence that you're, um, you're, you're doing something worthwhile. Um, another thing which I'd say is a general pointer as well is if you have a tendency to look at things maybe as right or wrong, which is is correct in some circumstances, this is probably not it. So I would try and avoid thinking of in terms of what you're motivated by, what you're driven by is right or wrong. It is just simply what you are motivated by or what you are not motivated by. So try and avoid that kind of right and wrong piece as well. Um, now, if you're anything at all like me or a lot of people I know, um, you can change your mind and things change from moment to moment. So what I would advise as well is when putting together an objective for what you want out of your role or career, I would actually write it down. I would write it down. Doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be well written, doesn't have to be excellent grammar. Just write down your thoughts, step away from it, walk away, do something else, come back to it, read it again and see what you think. Because our, because our emotions tend to change a lot from moment to moment, we can be in a good mood, bad mood, thinking about certain things. When kind of really thinking about an objective of what you want out of a career, that, that is definitely something I would advise doing, just writing it down, even, even go away for a day or so. So even give it 24 hours and come back and have a look at it again and see if your thoughts are the same on that when you come back and have a... And when, when, when you come back and have a look at it again, you may need to do this multiple times. It may not be something you do once. You might have to do this multiple times before you go, actually, I now have a clear objective of what I want out of my career. And that's not necessarily a job title or a specific job. It might be certain things I want to achieve out of that, out of that career. So for example, if your fundamental aim is the fact that you want to do a positive good and help people, there are multiple different careers you can do that in. If you want to, if actually earning potential and earning a lot of money is something that's important to you, there are multiple different ways you can do that. So just make sure you're clear on those objectives and that will give you that kind of opening you need to help you in terms of holding your standards high when you're looking for jobs. So that was kind of my section one. Has anybody got any questions so far? So before I move on to section two, has anybody got any points they want to they want to raise at the moment? Please feel free to either, I don't know if there's a chat box on this, um, I think there's a message function. Uh, please feel free to either drop a message or take yourself off mute. Um, I realize it can maybe be a bit overwhelming taking yourself off mute when there are quite a lot of people on the call. So I don't mind if you want to, um, if you do want to drop me, if you want to drop me a message. 
I will say alternatively as well, if you're a bit shy in terms of asking a question, that's absolutely fine. Uh, feel free to drop me a message afterwards and I'll quite happily answer you one-to-one -one if that's something you're more comfortable with as well. Um, so cool, I'm going to presume that there aren't any questions at this stage. So let's move on to section two. So section two is, this is worth thinking about as well. Well, obviously that's a bit of a silly statement. It's all worth thinking about or I wouldn't put it in my talk. So um, for my for my opinion. So have a look at long-term versus short-term outlook because they're both important. So the short-term and the long-term are both important and they're both worth considering. Now, what do I actually mean by this? So having a long-term objective is good, but do look at actually what you will be doing day to day in the job. And actually when you're meeting with people, when you are interviewing, when you are reaching out, ask those questions about what the day to day job will involve, because that's important because you're going to be spending a lot of hours doing that. So what the job actually involves day to day is, is really important. It might have a great job title. It might look prestigious but make sure it's actually something you want to be doing day to day and, and ask questions about that that's your best way to find out about that is find someone who already does that job and ask them about what they do or just if you're interviewing with someone ask them about what they do day to day so um it needs to be something that you are in some part motivated by day to day um otherwise that's going to be a pretty miserable existence and, and you want to make sure that if it's something you're really not motivated to do that motivation can definitely sag after a while and you might not get the results from it that you um that, that you want so so think about whether that's worth it now this this is where i'm going to contradict myself a little bit much as i probably wouldn't advise doing something day to day that you absolutely hate have a think as well of whether the short-term sacrifice is worth it for what you might long term for for what you might get in the long term so there are some jobs that require a not amazing start but can lead to somewhere great so that's something i would look at as well in terms of finding a good opportunity in a um finding a good opportunity in a tough market would be don't just look at the job at present look at what that job can get you and that's where it's really worth doing your research and have a look in and see how well have people been promoted in that business or that or that role in the past when people do that job do they tend to stick still and they don't progress do they tend to progress the areas they move into do they tend to move towards areas that you would like to go into or does that career take you in a direction you don't want to go into so have a look at that and see is that sacrifice worth it for what you might get long term and that that really is where your research is going to is going to pay off so have a look at people's social media profiles and um, have a look at do your research into that company and really find out where can that role for, um where can that role get you to and i'd say particularly as a particular as a graduate that's really important when you look at a job think about is this going to move me in the direction I want to go in? It's so is it something that I that hopefully motivates me? And at least if it doesn't motivate me, it's tolerable from the day to day. But does it move me in the direction I want to go in? Does it does it give me the skills that I need, or does it give me the progression opportunities um, that that I need? Does it does it somehow move me in that direction? That I that, that, that I want to go to uh, that, that I want to move towards, and that's something where having good questions lined up is really really important. I'm going to keep coming back to this theme as well. Having good questions is really important because that is a good way of how you can really evaluate whether someone's got a good enough opportunity for you. So when you are choosing a business to work for and a role to work for, it's always a two way process. It is never ever a case of the employer just choosing the employee. It is always about the employee choosing the employer as well. You always have the option to say no to an opportunity as well as saying yes to an opportunity. And it at least has to kind of be somewhere yes, because your time is valuable. So at least has to be kind of somewhere in that, in the right area for you to say yes. So I would get used to asking questions. That's really important. The types of questions I would ask as well, try and get into the habit of asking open questions. So a lot of you are probably aware of the concept of open questions already. If you're not aware of that, that is essentially ask questions that someone cannot give you a one word answer to. 
but someone has to give you an explanation to. So generally a why question is a, a why question is a good example of that. So why did you get into this career? career um, why did you get into this career? What have you done to progress, um, to progress in, this, in this industry? How will this role benefit me? Those are very simple examples, but those types of questions are much better than closed questions, which often are a, a doer and is question. Um, you can move on for those open questions as well by probing question would be really useful for you to ask to determine if it's going to be a right opportunity for you as well. And that is getting past the surface level answer. So once someone has given you an answer, asking a further question to really dive down and, and find out a bit more. So for example, you could ask, um, so just to give a hypothetical example, you could say, um, what future career options does this role give me? And the person might say to you, well, there's an option to get fast track into management. You could ask a probing question on that and say, okay, what exactly would I have to do to get fast tracked into management? Could you tell me about what the last person, could you tell me about the last person that went through that fast track route? Those will be really good questions because if the person struggles to answer that, that's probably going to give you an indication whether that's something you should, whether that's something you should go for or not. And that's a good way of balancing up that kind of short term and long term and long term view. There you go. I wasn't very smooth at hiding my notes there, was I? They came up on on screen on screen. So um, probably a good thing I can I can tell you here regarding the big versus the short picture is 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 look at the big picture, but don't ignore the brush strokes. So that's the end of section two. Before I move on to section three, has anybody got any questions at this point? So I'll just wait a couple of seconds just to see if anybody's got any questions. Um, if not, I will move on to I'll move on to section three. Cool, great. Let's move on to section three then. Um, so section three is, is very similar to section two, but this is so important, I thought it was almost worth kind of re-highlighting a little bit. And that is just being clear on your priorities. So, ask, so these are more asked questions to ask yourself. And before accepting any job and before going to any interview, I would ask yourselves, be I would ask yourself these questions and make sure you can answer them. So ask what matters most to you to ask yourself what matters most to you once you've answered that question ask yourself another question why to ask yourself why this might be something you want to write down as well if you write it down it often makes it a bit clearer and it might not be something you can answer straight away so it might be something you want to dedicate a bit of time to doing but i would always keep reminding you of yourself of that in terms of what is it that matters most to you and why? I would also say as well, ask what would you like, but what can you live without? So that should be another thing as well. And that, that, those are kind of your bargaining points. So think about what, what would you like, but what can you live without? And that kind of gives you, um, and, and that kind of gives you an element to give you a bit of a walking away point. So. I think every time you go to an interview, you look for a job, you, it helps to be clear on those priorities and not exactly necessarily what that job is in terms of job title or exact responsibilities, because again, in a, in a tough market, we might have to be a bit flexible as to what that is. But in terms of actually what your priorities are and what matters to you, if you can be really clear on what is important and what matters to you and what your priorities are, whether that is whether that is you need a certain salary. So for example, taking salary as an example, obviously when we're a graduate, probably gonna be difficult for us to demand a really high salary, but it still needs to, if you're going to say, spend six to 12 hours working a day, it still needs to be fair compensation. It needs to be something that allows you to pay your rent, that allows you to live a decent quality of life. So that's one example. It's good to have your priorities and make sure you know what would you accept and what would you walk away from? It puts you in a very strong position when negotiating and it puts you in a very good position in terms of simply whether to accept or turn away. So turn something away. So have that really clear. What is it that, what is it that matters most to you and what are, your, what are your priorities? 
The other thing I would be aware of, um, now this might be a little bit longer term, but definitely something worth considering is be aware that priorities do change over time. And they often are, they often are quite reliant on your other life conditions. So for example, while you're a student and at university, your priorities may be different to when you're outside of universities. And, and they might be the same. You may be someone that has very strong priorities. It might be something that it might be something that changes. And just be aware that it might change without you expecting it. So it is worth you going back and reviewing your priorities and reviewing what matters to you and just checking if that has changed over time. Because for some people throughout their entire um, throughout their entire lives, this never changes. Their priorities are the same. They are very set in, in what it is that really matters to them. For other people, it changes from month to month. And that's not a bad or a good thing. Going back to our whole, there isn't a right or wrong here. It's not a good or a bad thing. It just is the way it is. And it is worth having a look at that and just checking, am I actually working towards what my priorities are or have they changed a bit? So for example, uh, so, for example, people are further on in their career and they may have a lot of savings, maybe maybe kind of earnings and money isn't quite as important to them as it was earlier on. And maybe actually doing something that they find really challenging and interesting on a day to day basis takes a bit more of a priority. So this can change. Um, this can change as you as you go along. So um, and, and the final bit I've got to kind of say on this on section three is how would you feel? If you were, how would you feel if you accepted that offer and how would you feel if you turned it down? So if you turn down that offer and you didn't really have any any bad feeling at all, it was just, well, oh, well, I'll move on to the next thing. Probably suggest that might be that might not be the best opportunity for you to accept. So think about how and, and again, if actually you were going to get that offer and you wouldn't you're not going to be excited at all about it that probably tells you what you need to know now saying that when you accept a new a new job it's moving to a new a new chapter of your life essentially so it's understandable to be nervous and even perhaps quite severely apprehensive but you should still be a bit excited about it as well and if it doesn't excite you and you're not like oh, yes i'm really happy i've got this that's probably telling you what you need to know if your feeling is relief but it's not genuine excitement that probably is a bit of a warning sign for you. So I'd, I would look out for that as well. And it's, I think all of those points are, are things that definitely, definitely worth considering when looking for, particularly in a tough market. Cool. Um, so I'll tell you what, as, as I think people were, sorry, I can see a few people are waiting. So I presume I can click admit all and I can let them in. See if, they, see if they enter the call. Cool. So, guys, as as I think maybe people are a bit shy, which is fine. Didn't want to ask a question. I will just move straight on to. I will just move on straight on to section four, which is how to get started. So often this can be a bit overwhelming, and you can think, well, how do I actually get started in the first place? What 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 should I actually do? Um, my advice would be, just do something. The hardest thing when kind of looking for that new job is just is just getting started it, it's exactly the same as um it's exactly the same as actually perhaps i shouldn't be giving you advice in your studies because i i wasn't the best student either probably not the best thing to admit in a university talk but there were definitely far better students than me i'm sure all of you uh, but definitely far better student uni, students than me at uh at University of Exeter, but essentially it is similar to if you're doing coursework in terms of just do something. Um, it does get get started. So that can be something really little, but that, that first step is going to be the hardest. So whatever it is you do, just make some kind of first step. So that could be you could get a you could get a recommendation or a reference or a testimonial. If there's a someone at university worked really well with or a part-time job you've worked really well with a great start would be getting a reference from someone you've previously worked with like a previous manager a previous employer maybe your um maybe maybe a kind of a, a professor or lecturer you've worked with if you can get a testimonial recommendation from someone that you can use that will be as powerful as a cv by the way in many cases um that, that would be a really good start. Uh, something else could be actually just reach out to someone. 
employers usually really value that because it shows pre uh, proactiveness. If you see a company you want to work for, if you see someone you want to work with, don't necessarily wait for them to put out an advert, just reach out to them, reach out to them and actually just um, go out there, ask them if, um, and yeah, just, yeah, just reach out and just ask them about, can you, can you talk to them? Ask them if they've got any opportunities upcoming now or in the future. And, and, and that proactive approach will be, it is usually appreciated actually, even if they can't give you anything at the moment, it often makes you memorable in the right way. So that's something I'd recommend doing. And obviously I'm going to be a bit biased myself here because I used to be a recruitment consultant and I work for a recruitment consultancy. You could reach out to a recruitment consultant and ask them and ask them for their advice and see if they've got any opportunities as well. Um, you could simply you could apply for an app. You could just apply for an advert. You could update your update your CV. So just do something to start with. Once you've done that, that's probably where you want to get a bit more targeted afterwards. So do your research. Just if, if you don't know something about an industry or a role or a person, do your research on it and then you need to act on it. So I'd say every piece of research, every episode, every piece of research you do, I would say probably then you need to act on it in some way. And that's just really good at keeping yourself proactively involved. Otherwise, it's very easy to kind of say, hey, I've done a lot of research and then really realize you've not made any progress towards finding a role. So even if that research is to definitively cross off, no, I'm not interested in that. Just make sure you do something. Um, just make sure you do some research and then act and then and then kind of act on it. What I would say then, once you've done your research to give yourself um, to give yourself a bit more of a chance of getting success of that, make yourself a smart target so some of you may have heard of smart targets before you're all at university so i think there's a good chance you have heard of it but just very quickly for anyone that hasn't heard of a smart target that is something that is um so there are a few different definitions of it but the one i use is um specific so is it something that is absolutely specific that you, um so for example um a specific so for example a non-specific goal would be uh, I'm going to get fitter. A specific goal would be I'm going to run a marathon. It's something very quantifiable. Again, moving on from that, is it measurable? So, is it uh, is it qualitative versus quantitative? Can you measure your can you measure your results? Can you measure your progress on that? Then you could have the then you could have the uh, the, the A. Is it attainable? Is it is, is it actually realistic? So, for example. Um, Say, say, for example, I am going to, in three months' time, uh, find myself a stable, a stable job, um, it, which meets my main, which meets my main priorities. That's probably a realistic goal. Saying, in three months, I am going to be the CEO of a multinational corporation. That's probably a bit of an unrealistic goal. You might want to reevaluate a little bit. Um, obviously, an extreme example, but just to kind of make, just to kind of. Make, make the point as well. Um, then the next point would be, is it, is it relevant? Is it rele is, is what you're doing relevant to help you achieve your goals? So for example, I used the, I used the running a marathon uh, example earlier. Well, probably relevant training for running a marathon is going to be, is going to be running. If your training consists of heavy weightlifting and no running, that's probably yeah, it's, if, if it aims to get stronger and running the marathon is the way how you plan to do that, that's it's an admirable goal, but it's probably not really relevant. And then the T is time bound, and that's really important. And a lot of people miss that out. I would give yourself specific time, exactly the same as if you were studying. I would give yourself with your job search and with finding the opportunities, exact time spans and exact time scales. Um, that can be really important for making sure that you hit the um, you hit those kind of milestones that you want. And that's where I turn it from a smart goal into a smarter goal and put an ER on the end. And that's evaluated and readjusted. So have have points where you evaluate it, look at your progress and then reevaluate and then reevaluate that and how you want to move forward with that. So I would turn that into a smarter goal. Remind yourself of this as well. The worst they can do is say no. So that's something worth reminding yourself. Sometimes we might not reach out to, we might not reach out to people, we might not be proactive, but the worst that that person can do is say no. That, that, that really is it. Now, again, I would just for your, just because you don't want to waste your time, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't reach out to things that are completely unsuitable. So for example, if you're interested in getting into IT and you have no development experience, I probably wouldn't advise, I probably wouldn't advise applying for a senior developer role. I'd probably advise applying for a trainee developer role, but the worst they can do is say no. So don't be afraid to reach out to people. And, and you can be really proactive with this. You can, you can, you can phone into, I mean, it might be a bit harder in the current era because a lot of people aren't in the office, but you can call, you can try and call someone in the office, just call into the front desk and ask if you can speak that person, speak to that person, say that you've, um, that you've looked up their details, that you work in this area and you're interested in talking to them about it. A lot of people will appreciate your proactiveness and the worst they're going to do is say no, drop them an email, drop them a message on LinkedIn, wherever you find their details, drop them, um, just drop them a message or try to speak to them. Um, but proactiveness will go a long way and the worst they can say, the worst they can do is is no. The other thing to remember as well, and this is just so that you guys don't get disheartened with this, it may take a bit of time to see your results, but that doesn't mean you're not making progress. So it may take a while to get that good opportunity. It might take a while for the good roles to land in front of you, but it doesn't mean you're not making progress. Some, some things take consideration and you're getting practice in terms of what questions you can ask, what's the best approach to use with, with people. You're gaining your confidence when you speak to people, you're getting practice. So even if you don't get results straight away, just remember that that doesn't necessarily mean you're not making progress. And it's important to remind yourself of that sometimes. Cool. Um, so section five I've got is searching versus being found. And this is this is very important with finding the right opportunity because um, a lot of the times people will think, OK, I will put up my CV on a job board and I'll wait for people to find me and or I'll apply to an advert. Now, those are worthwhile things. Those are worthwhile things to do, and I wouldn't recommend you not doing those. Those are still good things to do, but those are only certain approaches you can do. And especially when there are a large flux of applications to adverts, and there are a um, and a lot of people put their CVs up on job boards. If you're waiting for people to find you, that may well not happen, especially with a lot of other people going on the going on the market. Your profile might just going to sound a bit blunt here, but your profile may not stand out. You're going to stand out more by your actions and what you do than what your CV says. So I would advise do those, but think about being proactive and reaching out to people, like we said before. If you see a job advertised, apply for that advert. Try phoning them as well. Don't just send your profile in and wait. Try, try phoning them and say, hi, I've sent my profile. You might not have seen it yet. If not, here's a reference I got from uh, from someone I've worked with uh, for, from a part-time job I did, or here's a reference I got from university showing my attributes. So don't be afraid. Um, so, so don't be afraid to do that. A lot of the, a lot of the best options, by the way, are never advertised. Um, I'm not going to quote you a specific figure because every study you see will give you a different percentage on this, but there are a lot of opportunities that are never advertised. And in particular a lot of really good opportunities and never advertise um so don't be afraid to reach out to people because they may well have opportunities they're just not advertised the other thing you'll do as well is if it's a company you particularly want to work for they may not be hiring at that particular moment in time but by reaching out to them they're going to remember you or there's a higher likely i should say there's a higher likelihood they're going to remember you and that's going to help you in the that's going to help you a lot in the future so um, sorry, Matt, just before sorry, um, before you continue, there's a question coming out in the chat from Alison. Oh, yes, sure. sure. Uh, yeah. Ah, OK, I can see the chat here. So uh, sorry, I'm just going to just going to ask uh, Alison. So I'm just going to answer Alison's questions here. Uh, hi, Matt. May I ask why you work in Singapore instead of in UK or Europe? What's the biggest, biggest difference between working in Singapore, Hong Kong and Europe? I'm Chinese and have good experience in China. Will I get more opportunity in Singapore than the UK? Um, Alison, that's a really good question. Why do I work in Singapore than the UK? Um, the previous company I worked for asked if I would like to relocate to Singapore um, to head up their learning and development function. Uh, something I'd always wanted to to do was experience living and working in another culture and that is why I moved to Singapore it's not I wouldn't say it's necessarily working in Singapore is 
from my, this is from my perspective. Some other people I'm sure will have other perspectives. But from my perspective, I don't necessarily think working in Singapore is better or worse than the UK or Europe, but it is quite different. And the working culture I've experienced is a bit different and I find that exciting. And that was when saying what's important to you, that was one of the things that was important to me was actually that option to live and work abroad in another culture. And that was actually one of the reasons why I chose to work for my previous company. A big reason why I chose the L&D job at that company was because it gave me the opportunity to live um, to live and work to, uh, to live and work to uh, work abroad. I have worked with Hong Kong as well. So I'll get to the other part of your question. What's the biggest difference between working in Singapore, um, Hong Kong and Europe? So a lot of it actually depends on the business that you work for. So, for example, the company I work for has its global headquarters in the UK and it has offices in Singapore and Hong Kong. So actually, the differences of the company I work for are probably going to be are probably going to be minimal uh, for other companies. Perhaps if they're based, perhaps if they're headquarters in a different company, that might be different. But that would be something I would what I would look at as well, Alison. I would have a look at whereabouts are the headquarters based, because there are uh, a bit, there are undeniably slight differences in slight differences in culture uh, between different places. So again, this is only my personal experience. I can't speak for everyone. Typically, what I found out, what I found working in Singapore and Hong Kong is and this is in comparison to the london sales market uh it's probably a little less abrupt uh working in singapore and hong kong probably have to be a little bit more careful in terms of business communication um about uh perhaps causing offense would be something that um that i had to be that i had to be aware of and i think if you're working in a culture that isn't your own that's probably something that you always have to be aware of because you're not going to be sure about the um about the cultural faux, faux pas something i would say that is particularly convenient actually about singapore and hong kong and might be a difference in comparison to europe is geographically singapore and hong kong are very compact so they're very easy to get around. So one of the things, and it seems like a minor thing, but actually it's made a big difference to me. Um, since working in Singapore, my commute has actually been a lot shorter um, and it makes a big, big difference. Um, in terms of, so again, I'm talking from a London perspective here, it's different in other places in the UK and Europe, but my living costs are probably comparable to London. If I live somewhere else in the UK or Europe, my living costs would probably actually be slightly lower than Singapore or Hong Kong. Living costs are a bit higher in Hong Kong than Singapore. You do have to look at taxes as well, though. So tax will be a lot higher in the UK uh, and generally Europe, whereas tax tends to be a bit lower in Singapore and Hong Kong. So that's something that, although those things do change um, with different governments and over time as well, but that's something that you have to have to bear in mind. Um, whether for better or worse, the, the weather's a lot more predictable in uh, weather's a lot more predictable in Singapore. It's a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot hotter. Something I would say to bear in mind if you are looking at um, working in Singapore is that Singapore is very much, um, so the government is very much looking to build a Singapore core. So if you need a visa or an employment pass, it is not impossible to work in Singapore at the moment. However, it is more difficult than it was, say, six months to a year ago. It is noticeably more difficult. If you are a Singapore citizen, it is a lot easier, especially to get an entry level job in Singapore than it would be if you do need a foreign uh, foreign work pass. It's not impossible, but if you do need a visa to work in Singapore, you probably would need to do quite a lot of searching and quite a lot of looking to find a company that has the quota and availability to do that. So the issue a lot of companies have is that they're already at their quota limit of how many visas they can take on. So that is something I would consider um, if you are looking for roles in Singapore. Um, if you are, um, so Alison, you said you are Chinese, something that very much may work in your favor is something that's particularly valuable in the Singapore market, uh, particularly speaking about my market, if you're doing a sales role and you're dealing with a lot of different clients is having somebody that is fluent in English and Mandarin is often 
them something that is actually very um, is something that is valuable. So that is something that may work in your that is something that may work in your um, yeah may work in your may work in your favour. Uh, something I would say definitely about Singapore is it's pretty stable. So it's fairly stable, it's fairly predictable. That doesn't mean it doesn't have challenges like you would get in other parts of the world, but it does tend to be fairly, it, at least at the moment, it does seem to be fairly predictable. And you will get quite a lot of, you will get a, quite a lot of pre-warning if something, if conditions are going to change as well. I hope that, uh, hope that answered your question. Uh, and then Kelvin, uh, do you like to work in Singapore? Like the working culture, job market, living standard, um, so Kelvin, simple answer is yes. Yes, I do. So I like working in Singapore. Um, I would have the option to move back to the UK if I wanted. I choose not to. I enjoy living in, um, you're welcome, Alison. Uh, I enjoy working in Singapore for a number of reasons. Um, so just personally, I won't tell you too, I won't bore you guys too much personally. I have a very outdoor lifestyle. Uh, I enjoy things like, um, I enjoy things like, windsurfing, wakeboarding, that type of thing. Um, Singapore is a great place to have that type of lifestyle. So if you quite like to live somewhere that's sunny and got an outdoor lifestyle, Singapore is good for that. It tends to be fairly relaxed as well. I would say Hong Kong's probably got the more vibrant like nightlife. Singapore is probably a little bit more chilled out, more relaxed. Uh, but yeah, it's generally a fairly relaxed place to live. And if you like an outdoor lifestyle, it's a good place to live. Cool. Um, and really sorry if I do. Uh, no, nope, you're well. You're welcome, Kelvin. I'm really apologise if I do mispronounce uh, mispronounce your name. This is my issue, not yours at all. I'm guessing we're going to go with um, Zhao Pauline. Could you could you help me out there? Have I have I done well with the pronunciation, or or have I embarrassed myself? Well, sometimes when you look at the pinyin, it's difficult, right? I can honestly say this is. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not sure how to pronounce your name in Yue Chao or it could be another uh, pronunciation. Okay. So sorry about that. Okay, well, Chao, I do apologize if I get your name wrong. I, I really apologize, but I will do my best. So Chao. So I am still a graduate student in the UK. How can I apply for a post in Singapore? Does the company value professional background? So yes. So short answer, companies are going to value professional backgrounds. My advice to you would be the same as before. You may as well apply because if you don't apply, the answer is always going to be no. The only thing I would say is if you are not a Singapore citizen and you are applying for roles in Singapore, um, at the risk of sounding very negative, you will get a lot of rejections at this stage. And this is do not take that as a personal reflection of you. This is simply because companies are very restricted in terms of the in terms of the visa passes they can offer. So you will have a fair bit, you probably will have a fair bit of rejection for that. However, the criteria for those passes does change depending on the economy. And if you have a skill that you can show is valuable to an employer and they have the options to take on those visas, then it is potentially an option. I don't want to give you false hope. I just want to be really careful that I'm not doing that. So I would say look for companies that, so a, a good way you could maybe work in Singapore if you're prepared to take a bit more of a long-term approach is work in another company, maybe one that is based in the UK um, or based in China. Uh, or, or, Hong Kong, or Hong Kong or wherever, um, work for that company, show you are absolutely invaluable to them and that nobody else would be able to do your job. And then it shouldn't be as difficult for you to get a transfer because essentially, um, oh, sorry, Eva. Um, so a lot of, um, so, oh, so yeah, so a lot of, uh, so, oh, sorry, I said, uh, so I got the name on there before Matthew, making embarrassing myself by getting everyone's name wrong. But anyway, uh, yeah, with uh, in terms of working in Singapore, you may as well apply. Having that professional, having professional background will help. Things like having references or testimonials in advance definitely do help. Something that will help with a professional or even an academic background is I wouldn't just list the skills you have. I would list the successes you've had with that. So if you can put down the successes you've had or challenges you've overcome, it makes you feel much more complete. So for example, if you say you have a certain skill, 
that tells a company that in some capacity you've worked in that skill. If you tell a company that you have this skill and these are the successes you've got from it, that company can now visualize a bit better how you can apply that knowledge to their business and it makes you a more attractive candidate. So those are a couple of things I can suggest. So I'm afraid I can't give you a afraid I can't give you a hundred percent view there in terms of definitively getting a job in Singapore, but those are some things that can help, but it can sometimes help working for a company that is based somewhere else, showing that you're absolutely invaluable and showing that no one else would be able to do that job and then getting a transfer. But that would definitely be something if you're looking at the more long-term view. But if you guys are interested in working in different cultures and different countries, maybe actually look at some of those slightly larger businesses. So startups are great, but have a look at some of those slightly larger businesses so have a look at some of those slightly larger businesses that have offices based in various locations around the globe and you may well be you may well be able to transfer at some point ask at an interview ask actually i see you are a global business what what would i need to do what are the opportunities to be able to work in different offices around the globe so if that's something you're interested in um that's definitely something i would do Cool. Um, just making sure I've got everyone's questions. Were there any more questions there? Um, ah, okay. So, hi there, Matt. So, it's worth getting confused. So, uh, so, Matthew, may I ask you what are the challenges for you when you relocated to Singapore? Um, so, one of the challenges I had when I relocated to Singapore, and I think a lot of you are studying abroad from your families and friends anyway so this might be something you're a little bit more used to but essentially one of the challenges was just um simply living on the other side of the simply living on the other side of the world um to where my family were to where um to where my kind of friends were and essentially it's like having to start again because when you live somewhere you've never lived before as i'm i'm sure i'm speaking to a lot of you that already have experience of this there's a lot of a lot of the challenges were simply essentially you're not just starting a new job you are starting your life again you are you are kind of that sounds a bit severe you obviously stay in touch with people back home but you have to rebuild that social circle you have to kind of rebuild things the other thing as well is that there are slight cultural differences in the way different countries business etiquette works and if you can get some advice from someone who is local before you move to that company, that's something I would definitely advise. Speaking to Singaporeans before moving to Singapore was very, very helpful because they were able to give me some insights that someone that wasn't local to that country wasn't able to, to get. So I think the other thing as well, in terms of adapting to that new culture, adapting to that different way of working, um, I think the other thing is accepting it takes a bit of time to understand that culture. So I still wouldn't say Singapore is a very diverse, it's a it's, it's an amazing culture because of that. It's a very diverse, very, very varied culture. And because of that, it does actually take quite a long time to properly understand it. And I say, I still don't understand Singaporean culture 100%. And not being Singaporean, I don't think I ever will understand it 100%. But it takes you a while to get past part some of your initial maybe, yeah, initial kind of unconscious preconceptions and get past some of those and really start to understand and, and sometimes just the little things of why people will sometimes act in a certain way or do certain things they do and I think it can take you a little while it can take you a little while to get used to that so I'd say if you've previously so 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 Matthew if you've previously lived and worked in another or, or studied in another country as it looks like you have you will probably already have a head start over what I, you will probably already have a head start over what I did. But my advice would be speak to as many locals as you can before you get there. It will give you a really good, it will, it will give you a really good boost with that. Cool. Um, great. Were there any other questions at this stage? Um, if anybody feels like I haven't answered their question adequate, adequately, uh, please do put something in the message box and I'm happy to, um, yeah, happy to continue that. So cool, just to kind of continue where I think we last were. So we were we we're on the point of how to get started. So um, so we're so research and act on it, smarter goals, worst they can do is say, say no. Um, as I was saying, the point I left off with was just, um, just be careful not to waste your time as well. Much as you want to reach out to a lot of people, 
again, with that SMART goal in terms of being realistic, reach out to things that are going to be relevant to you. So reach out to things that are not so far off what you want that you're going to be wasting wasting your time. Um, so that is something I would say as well. So um, we are, where where was I here? So, okay, so we're saying reach out to people directly. Um, try and, um, now I, I'm going to be a bit of a hypocrite here because I'm, I'm not the best on social media, much as my much as our marketing division um, keep keep telling me to um, to, to make updates. But um, make your social media uh, profiles attractive to um, attractive to potential employers. So um, let's just use one example. So it's just one of many social media platforms. But for example, uh, let's take LinkedIn for example. If you want to be found as well as searching for people, make sure you've got the words and comments on there that people would be looking for so um so let's say if you if you are really interested in it development make sure those development languages are on your social media profile make sure they're on your linkedin profile make sure they're on your cv if you want to be found make yourself as easy to be found as possible put in the words that people will look for it's a very simple piece of advice that but it's amazing how many people when you see when they're starting out and i think sometimes in the attempt to to be creative or original will word things in a slightly unusual way and it makes it very difficult to find them so if you know people in your industry use or the industry you want to work in use certain words use those words make it make it easy for you to be make it easy for you to be um, found the other thing as well is about impressing the right people so you may want to ask this as a question. You may want to just look up, but make sure you, you identify who makes the decisions. So who is going to make the decision over who hires you or not? Find out who you would be working with as well as do you like the job? Do you like the opportunity? Is, is that a person you could is that a person you could be working with? Is that somebody you could get on with day to day? It might be that you've discovered a work opportunity that you really like, but actually you just can't see yourself getting on with the people in that job. So you may need to look for a different manager, but the same job. You may need to look for the same job in a different business. So look at, for example, is again, people be probably a bit tough sometimes in interview, but look at is that somebody you could work with? Also look at who could influence a decision as well. So other people you might need to impress might not necessarily be the person that makes that end decision, but the person that influences, um, so the person that influences that decision. So often what I would advise is try and impress to an extent every person you meet because you don't know what part they're going to play in that decision. So one of my first jobs I ever went to, um, I realized actually after I started, that my manager the first thing he would do would always be he would always ask our receptionist how did they greet you and she would and she would say for example yep they're really polite they're nice and friendly or okay they didn't even say hello they and that would form his initial impression so always treat everybody like they could have an influence on the decision you never know um so rather than just the direct manager think about who else has an effect on that um ask yourself do you, you obviously to, to get the choices so having choices is good so having choices will allow you to turn makes it easier to turn opportunities down as well as accept opportunities and to give yourself those more choices ask yourself do you know what the do you know what the decision maker is interested in knowing are you making an assumption that they know are you making an assumption or are or or do you generally know what they're interested in and don't be afraid to ask if you don't know what someone's looking if you think you might be assuming you know what someone's after um don't be afraid to ask and i would say when graduates interview with me this is probably actually one of the biggest mistakes people make they all uh, they, they will often make an assumption with what i want to hear rather than just ask me what i want to know whereas if you ask a potential hiring manager what do you want to know about me what are you looking for you'll get a bit of a better impression about one, what the job actually is going to involve and what they're going to be like as a manager. And you'll also get a better idea of how to impress them as well. So, so I'd always question yourself on that. Or am I just assuming I know what this person wants? Do I actually, or do I actually know what they want? So great. So moving on to um, final section, uh, 
which is section seven. So I've talked here about identifying what you want, maybe being a bit more open to some opportunities you may not have originally thought of. Um, and, and part of that is as well as knowing what to turn down, be flexible as well. So the best opportunity may not necessarily be what you originally thought. You might need to be a little bit open. You might need to be a little bit open minded with it. You might need to think, well, actually, this isn't what I'd initially thought of going into. But actually, it does hit my priorities. It does hit what I want. It is something I can be satisfied with. And it doesn't I wouldn't necessarily think of it as something you'd be doing forever, but think of it of does it move me in the right direction? Does it move me in the direction I, I want to go? Um, so I, I would really consider that. And then, yeah, finally, to um, just to wrap up, guys, uh, there we go. I actually managed to stay within the hour. So I shouldn't, shouldn't sound so proud of myself, but I managed to do that, should I? But uh, there we go. So, guys, thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, really really appreciate uh yeah really appreciate you all joining me today on this um on this call i hope i've at least made a few comments to you that can be helpful and that you can and that you can put forward um just some things there to kind of think about and to kind of take into consideration when you are looking for new job opportunities for yourself and hopefully some things to question yourself to make sure when you do accept something you accept the right thing so guys thank you very much and i'm gonna gonna leave the floor open for questions people have thank you very much matt just um while you're having a drink here um going back to the part when you said you know be proactive in reaching out mm -hmm. um, and you know don't be afraid when you want some information from the company or the recruiter um, I sometimes feel that um, when I was doing my last job um, I know my colleague they they're really brave in you know co just calling up and to ask information to say oh can I come in to have a visit can mm -hmm. I talk to the person who's hiring to get more information and um, for me I think for a lot of Chinese people or uh, from Asia, we have that shyness in, you know, should I do this? If I do this, would they, would they, you know, just tell me off or would they not want to engage? So what would you suggest that when you really maybe pick up the phone or uh, write an email to ask for more information, what do we need to actually prepare? Because, you know, do you need a scenario in, um, mm. you know, actually, is it is it too much to ask too much many questions or you know sometimes maybe one question is not enough to get in, enough information that's actually really yeah that's that, that, that's a really good point um that's a really good point there pauline and i think actually that is something that um and, and guys don't be worried about this i think that's something a lot of people have where perhaps they'll have that initial initial shyness and as i as i said i would refresh back to the worst they can do is say no. Um, so a couple of things that I can advise that might help you along with this is, sorry, I'm just gonna take another sip of water. I'm losing my voice a bit today. So one of the things I would advise is show some value. So when you, so when you call that person or when you email them, and this will hopefully give you a bit of confidence, think about what is the benefit that you can offer to them if you think about what the benefit is that you can offer to them it will help you a lot so that might be for example you approach them with a reference from someone you've worked with previously and you can demonstrate that actually the benefit you would give to them is that you are someone that is reliable you are hard working you're proactive so because you're reaching out to them so you could have real value to their business maybe it is language skills maybe it's the fact that if you're reaching out to someone in singapore you are fluent in mandarin and english and you are profession and you can't just speak both those languages you're actually professional you you can speak both those languages to a professional level so you could be really valuable to that organization so think about the benefit you're going to have and i would really think about that because as as much i wouldn't necessarily say as a graduate you necessarily need that to grab someone's attention but it can help from your perspective because if you feel like you can offer someone value if you feel like you can offer someone a benefit that is going to help you have a lot more confidence because it's going to make the conversation less one way it's less about then you reaching out and asking them for a favor asking them for help it's more about actually this is a two-way process i'm reaching out to you because i feel like i have something of value i would actually typically do less is more. 
in, in regards to the questioning. So if you ask too many questions at once, as you can probably tell from the rest of my talk, I'm a big fan of questions. I like asking questions, whether that's of yourself to be reflective or other people. But I would ask fewer rather than more questions at a time, because if you ask too many questions, what can often happen is the message can kind of get a little bit lost. So what I would do is I would probably ask an, an impact question. So often you, you could even be, and this is a little bit presumptuous, but you can maybe even go, as, as far as kind of suggesting a next step. So what else would you like to, what else would you like to see from me? How can we move this process forward? Uh, what else can I show you for you to be interested in my application? Um, so you might want to ask just one or two questions. And I think something I do want to stress to you guys as well is you will undoubtedly have people saying no to you. Now, if actually, some, if actually that direct outreach is something you don't want to do, it isn't something you need to do to successfully get a job. You can successfully get a job by applying to adverts, putting your CV up online. You, you, you can be successful from that. It will probably just take you a little bit longer. So if you're thinking, this sounds terrifying and it's something I absolutely don't want to do, you don't... You, you don't have to do it to find a job. You can find a job in the end using the other methods. It might just take you a little bit longer, but if you are confident reaching out to people directly, it will just speed up the process for you. And though that's my advice. I would ask fewer questions rather than more, make it focused about pushing for the next, the next thing to happen and make sure you've got a clear benefit. Because if you've got a clear benefit, and I think that will help you in your confidence and in terms of your applications in, in itself. And you can think about whether that's things from your personality trait or your previous experience. But I would say that that's probably something to sit down and think about. Think about what is the benefit I offer in terms of what can I offer in terms of my personality, in terms of my skills. So for example, I've, I've had people use the fact that um, particular work they've done in their degree. Uh, maybe they've been, say, they, they've held a particular position in a certain society they've been a member of. Uh, they do things, uh, they do charity work, whatever it is. Think about what benefit, what attributes you offer that are benefit and actually help just a little bit with the confidence. It won't make it go away completely, but it should just help you. The other thing as well is, is practice. The first time you do it is always, when you reach out to somebody, it's always absolutely terrifying. But it's one of those things, like most things, with practice, it gets easier, it gets better. And if you if you practice it, and, and look, if you're just reaching out to say, hey, I'm a fresh graduate, I thought I'd be productive, I thought I'd reach out because I feel I have these attributes and I would like to find out how I can work with your, with your company. On occasion, you may get someone that's a bit rude, but actually, as long as you approach it in a professional manner like that, even if people say no, most of them are probably most most of them are probably going to be fairly most of them are probably going to be fairly polite in 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 turning you down there. So, um, so um, did that did that answer your question, Paulie? Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. I just want to ask you if you're happy to briefly talk about the roles that you are hiring for Singapore office. I think some students might uh, be interested in how to apply, what's the requirement and you know what's the process. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, so we are so, so we are hiring at the moment for uh, associate recruitment consultants. So we are looking for people that haven't necessarily done sales or recruitment before as a role, uh, but people that are competitive and are fairly, yeah, people that are people that are competitive, people that are want to learn, people that want to develop, and we are looking for them to do what we call a full recruitment role. So that would involve new business development, that would involve uh, working with candidates, account management, uh, managing processes. And what we would do is we would put you through a full training program for this. Um, so we'd put you through a full a full training program for this, and um, and then. And then hopefully after that, you can progress through the, our progression scheme through being an associate to a consultant, senior consultant, and, and then up through the up through our kind of promotion runs. A lot of our managers here have actually started with us in more junior positions and progressed 
um, progressed through there being um, consultants in our business. So if that's the type of thing that might be of interest, um, if you're interested in working in Singapore, we may potentially in the future have some opportunities coming up in Hong Kong as well. Uh, but if that's something that's of interest to you, if you're interested in working in an international company that has a good training scheme to help you deal with, uh, to help you deal with clients and learn those skills, um, and you'll be unlucky enough to work with me every day as well, uh, then that is something that we can, uh, and that is something that we can offer. Uh, the best way to apply so there are two ways so we have a so we have an advert up on our website so that's eames consulting uh, or you can just simply drop your profile to or you can or you can simply drop your profile to me so what i do what i will do is i will drop my email address um, and the link to our advert to pauline um, Pauline, sorry, I'm electing you to do this, but hopefully you can share with everyone afterwards. Uh, I'll be honest, if you're interested in the job, it's probably best just to reach out to me, um, just to reach out to me directly. I am going to give a little bit of guidance here in terms of saying um, we are, it is much easier for us to take on someone who is a Singapore citizen or has permanent residency in Singapore. However, look, um, if you're not a Singapore citizen, I'm still happy to talk to you. If, um, if we're not able to consider you, I'm still happy to give you a bit of advice and maybe point you in the right direction of some places that might be, uh, might be might be worth looking at so that's the only caveat i'm going to give um, i would love to be able to consider everyone um, unfortunately those are a couple of constrictions we do have at the minute but as i said uh, feel free to still reach out to me because even though we've got a few restrictions at the moment you never know how things might change for the you never know how things might change for the future i could probably point you in the right direction even if unfortunately we wouldn't be able to consider you for for the roles we for the roles we have here Thank you very much, Matt. I think it's good for everyone to know that also you, as someone who graduated from Exeter, who's been yes. here and done your journey in your career path, that we appreciate that what you're saying is to, if if they're not temporarily, um, can apply a role in Singapore or Hong Kong, but also have that connection with you in pointing out ways that they can try or method they can use in this difficult time. Yeah, and guys, actually, look, just look, just have a bit of confidence in in yourselves as well. So, um, so, so you're, you're all students at a really good university that is not easy to get into. So, you guys have all proven yourself by um, by that point. Looking at most of you, it looks like most or perhaps even everyone on the call has actually um, taken that really difficult step of at a young age going and living in a foreign country, which is not an easy thing to do. So. Um, Guys, actually, actually just back yourself and back your own value. And if you do that, you will, that will really help you in looking for, for new opportunities. And, and as I said, I, I, I mean, unfortunately, I graduated some time ago, but I, I, I graduated from Exeter University. Um, and again, in, in my career path as well, I, I will quite happily say it hasn't always been just an upwards trajectory. I've had kind of various kind of bits where I've progressed really quickly in and I've had bits where perhaps I've kind of plateaued a bit but just yeah just make make sure that what you're doing leads you in the direction you want to go and that the thing as well I much as I wouldn't advise job hopping I would say definitely stick something out because it often takes you quite a while to it often takes you quite a while to figure out um, what it is that you really like doing. It certainly did with me. Um, if you actually do a job and you know what, after a couple of years, it really isn't what you want to do. You don't have to do that job forever. It's your choice to go um, to go somewhere else. But I think sometimes that lacking confidence in your abilities is is something I think that holds. So I'm, I'm making an assumption here a bit, so bear with me. But I do think that lacking that confidence and particularly um, again, it was nowhere near as severe as as for you guys, but there was a bit of an economic downturn when I uh, graduated as, as well. Again, I know it wasn't as severe, and I think sometimes that lack of confidence can hold back. So just back uh, back yourself, work on work on identifying the benefits you can offer. Be proactive in your approach, and it may take you it may take you a little bit longer than you expected to find the right opportunity, um, but give it time, and and you will get there. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, so 
for those who don't have questions, feel free to leave. Uh, what I'll yep. do is I'll type my email address here for those who wants to reach out to Matt maybe later on or have any questions that I can pass to Matt later. But thank you very much, Matt, for your time. I know it's getting late in Singapore, no, no, so hopefully no you'll at all. be able to get some dinner in time. <laughs> um, well, I've got to call with my dad, actually. It's my dad's birthday today, so I've got to call with my dad after this. But um, but actually, look, um, guys, if you, if you found this useful, I know you guys have probably all got busy days, so feel feel free to leave the feel free to leave the call as Pauline said. But if anybody does have any questions, I'm quite happy to stick around for a bit and ask people's questions. Um, oh, you oh, got birthday go. wishes. Birthday. There you go. Happy birthday to my dad. Yes, he's an old man. So. Um, Cool, brilliant. Thank you for that, Kelvin. So, um, guys, if you do have any other, 